Okay. So now we're moving from the kind of what midwives are doing with physiology, and we're going to go on to love that birth physiology. And I'm delighted to in, welcome Molly O'Brien, who's come to share her love of birth, birth physiology. And again, this is an edited highlights of her CV because she's a very experienced and a very interesting person totally. She's a midwife, associate lecturer, creator and teacher of biomechanics for birth courses for birth professionals and associates and a birth preparation class called Moving for an Easier Birth. She's a very experienced midwife. She's been a hypnobirth and birth preparation teacher, associate university lecturer. She's created courses for midwives and birth associates. And she was, she's, this has all come from her frustration with how birth was being managed, if I've got this right, Molly, yes. and has realized that there's a better way. And it, some of this is about us understanding what normal physiology is. So I was delighted that Molly could join us this afternoon. So I will say to you, Molly, the screen is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And it's really, um, I think the programme was very well set out because I loved what Claire had to say and uh, the last thing she said, in fact, about the observing and listening to the woman and the birthing person, it means so much. And in fact, that's where I got a lot of my information so I could actually um, uh, create these courses about biomechanics for birth that came from watchful attendance. And I think that's a real midwifery skill that has been lost because, well, of lots of reasons, but I'll move on from that. That's another discussion. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about my favourite subject, and that is birth physiology. And something that I wonder if we actually know enough about is the wonderful pelvis. Um, it's an amazing articulated piece of architecture, human architecture, where the baby passes through. And yet I really don't feel that we spend very much time on that at all. So do we know enough about that? And on the screen, you can see there's a few, um, a few pictures there. This is, I think, and it might, you might, I mean, I would say 80% of midwives um, and doctors will recognize these uh, pictures here, the um, pelvis, the bony part of the pelvis and the pelvic floor, or at least one layer of the pelvic floor that is taught, um, frequently taught in our training. And there's much more to it. And I think that this gap in our knowledge about the intricacies of the pelvis really affects how we um, how we help women when there's a labor dystocia, which is complicated by a biomechanical issue. There's always going to be a reason why that baby is not coming out. I mean, I've come to the conclusion very much in my practice over 20 odd years working in the NHS with a lot of, uh, you know, attending a lot of births, that indeed um, three main disruptors of the birth process, which makes it very difficult, is fear, which is why I'm a hypnobirthing um, instructor, um, medicalization for um, <laughs> multiple layers there, um, that disrupts the process. And the other main disruptor is a biomechanical issue. What's stopping the baby come through the pelvis? And does this information that we are given in our training, does that help us to help the women and birthing people who are struggling with that? And I don't believe it is, not at all. And I'm going to show you what I think we need to know. Well, what I know that we need to know. So, this gives us an impression we've got a bony pelvis, of course we do, um, but it's much more interesting and more complex than what we're seeing in these pictures. These pictures, of course, are, are valuable too, I'm not, not dissing them, but we need to know more. What about that? I think that's amazing. And we are looking at um, 
multitude of layers of muscles. And what you can see there actually is fascia as well, which is connective tissue. And um, we'll, we'll go on and we'll have a look at ligaments as well. So we've got lots of... Um, Lots of things going on in the pelvis. It's not just a bony pelvis. And dimensions, it's got layers and layers that actually have an effect on how it sits in the body. And that will have an effect on how the baby passes through. In the, 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 the larger, um, uh, the, the, the longer uh, pictures here with the, the whole of the back and some of the leg, you can see that actually these muscles are actually attached to the pelvis. The pelvis is carrying our weight. It, it's, it's doing a great, I mean, it's doing a huge job and it's going to take some, um, some battering through our lives as we, we pass through our lives. We have accidents, we, we, we do things, we've got bad posture. We do all sorts of things that are going to have an effect on the balance of that pelvis. And, um, as you can see, the hamstrings are attached. Uh, uh, actually, they, they, they connect up to the sacrotuberous ligament here on the pelvis, on the ischiotuberosities, which then attach to the sacrum. So this is attached, or you could say we're attached from the foot all the way through to the top of our head in one line. We're all connected. Every muscle is joining every other muscle. And that plays a part in balance. So let's have a quick look at um, some of these muscles that are associated with balance. We have the psoas muscle. Did we learn about that in our training? I doubt very much. It might be some of the newer midwives have, and I hope that's true. I do speak to uh, student midwives and they are telling me they're, they're learning a little bit more, which is amazing. And that's what we need to, to do. We need to investigate and explore much further. So the psoas muscle is the longest uh, muscle we have that actually attaches the trunk to the leg and it passes through the uh, pelvis and it also is, um, believe it or not, has, it holds, um, it's, it's associated with the flight and fight uh, response. And so it can tense up and um, not function very well if we have a lot of fear. Everything's connected, you see, it's fascinating stuff. Uh, adductus from the inside of the knee pass right up onto the, the ischial tuberosities and hold the um, pelvis in place there. And if it's tight, that's going to pull and, and bring it out of balance a little bit. The gluteus maximus, the great look at this, this is the back of the pelvis. This is the gluteus maximus, minimus and medius. And there are layers of them, uh, these muscles onto the um, large hip bones. Notice that they're not on the sacrum itself. The sacrum hasn't got uh, muscle across it, but the hip bones do. And the piriformis is attached to the sacrum and then it goes through the pelvis onto the top of the femur. And then on top of that, we've got ligaments as well. So ligaments, connective tissue, which is covering all our muscles and uh, the broad ligament is one of those large ones that we have covering the uterus, holding it in place. The round ligaments, almost acting like guy ropes in fact, um, are, are passing through into the mons um, pubis, uh, some of the fibres and into the labia. Uterosacral ligament, that's holding the another one holding the uterus in position, um, attached to the sacrum and to the lower part of the uterus, in fact, the cervical area. And you can imagine if you have got an imbalance in your pelvis, that will affect how the uterus is sitting inside um, and how the space that the baby has available. We've also got the cardinal ligaments, can't see it in that picture, but the cardinal ligaments are very important ligaments. They are attached to the sides of the pelvis and they merge a little with the uterosacral ligaments and they're again holding the, um, the uterus in position. And I love this picture. It's the, this is the, the back of the pelvis, 
again, you, you saw the muscles there. We talked about the gluteus minimus, medius and maximus and the piriformis. And that's the sacrum covered in ligaments. And of course, we've got everything we need um, to, to give birth. We have all the hormones and the hormones relaxing and prostaglandin. Is, they, are, um, they are helping us to um, be more relaxed. Our ligaments are more relaxed in our bodies when we're pregnant. And that means that they can move and make more space as the baby grows and passes through the pelvis during the birth process. Um, we talk about the ischial spines, and I think it's really interesting that we, uh, we know about the ischial spines, don't we? As in a, an imaginary line, really, uh, to, to, to designate where the baby is in the pelvis. Is it high? Is it above the ischial spines? Is it lower? Uh, yet we are very unaware of the fact that actually the ischial spine is a ligament attachment point. And I think that's really interesting. I'm sorry that we're not told that because that would make a lot of sense. Because if you can feel an ischial spine, then that means that that part of the pelvis is being pulled inwards where it shouldn't really be in the effort. There is a restriction. And this is the kind of information that midwives really need to know about. Because if we knew about that, then we can develop strategies and uh, solutions to help women who are struggling with a labor dystocia. And in fact, we do have some of those hip opening and muscle releasing um, uh, positions and techniques. But uh, we are, we're certainly at a disadvantage by not understanding how this pelvis moves. And this is, uh, sorry, not a great slide here, but this is going to, we're talking now how it actually opens up. And I remember as a midwife, I used to say to women, oh, you know, don't worry, your, your pelvis is going to open. And I think, please don't ask me how, because I'm not quite sure. But it took me many years later and self-study to find out that actually nutation and counter nutation is a thing. It's how the pelvis opens and moves and creates um, increases dimensions I'm just going to get my pelvis here and I'll show you this this is the pelvis now this is what we're talking about right now is nutation now nutation is the this is the sacrum here and the nutation means it's nodding forward now of course I'm grossly exaggerating but you can see what happens it nods forward and if it nods forward it decreases the inlet this part, the, the brim, because it's nodding forward, but it's increasing the outlet. And that, that makes a difference. And we need to know about that. That's really important stuff. I'm going to just show you. Uh, and of course, counter notation is the opposite. So the counter notation is pushes back like that, which means it's opening, it's making more space in the, the brim but it's reducing the space here in the outlet. And who, we are, I, I, not many um, universities are teaching uh, midwives about that, although it is coming, but we all need to know about it and the doctors need to know about it because it affects our practice and we can hinder birth instead of facilitating this process, we can actually make it more difficult. Let's have a look. I'm just going to show you this uh, little video as an animation of exactly what I've just been talking about, counter notation and nutation. It doesn't have any um, sound, so it's about two minutes. So I'm just going to share that with you. And towards the end, you'll see we, it's actually talking about rotation of the femur as well. And that is really significant. So you can see it's separate. Uh, these bones are separate, joined together with ligaments. going backwards and the, the hip bones are flaring open so they're increasing the dimension um, at the brim and notation does the opposite 
and that moves the ischial tuberosities, which is your sit bones, and it opens it up, opens up the outlet, making more space for the baby to come through. You see how the, the hip bones move together there. They come opening that brim, which means they're reducing the outlet or they're doing the opposite. And it's just seeing it from a different viewpoint there from the side. There you are, nutation, tailbones going out, making more space. And of course, we've got the pubic uh, symphysis pubis as well. And that's creating more space. So we can have space. Of course we can. We're built for this. And this is femoral rotation. And this is really important because there's something that midwives do a lot of. Mm. You see how they're rotating. So rotating your uh, or, or, or abducting your legs. Look at this. You see how it brings those ischial tuberosities inwards. So abducting your legs and the midwife says, open your legs and make more space. It's actually doing the opposite. And that is why it's very hard for us if we haven't got that information in our training. We say things that make sense to us because open your legs to us makes us feel like you're making more space. But in fact, it's doing the opposite. So abducting the legs, the femurs, is going to reduce the outlet. It's bringing the tuberosities together. You can try that by sitting on your, your hands and opening up, um, doing that very thing of opening up your legs and paying attention to where your ischial tuberosities are moving. Now, it's only a little bit, but a little bit of space means a lot when you're having a baby, doesn't it? If you had to rotate your femurs, and uh, putting your knees, pointing your knees towards each other and your toes towards each other, and that's rotating your femurs, and that does the opposite. That's actually going to open that space up. <clears throat> now, of course, women and birthing people often left to their own devices will do it instinctively. And to me, that's the ultimate thing is that we actually have environments and a belief in the physiology and an understanding in the physiology so that um, we can um, help uh, women and birthing people to be free to move and find their own solution if they're having a struggle. And if they are unable to do that, then we can step in and offer um, assistance if we know how to. So I want us just to reflect on a few questions. I think um, just to check my timing here. This is a very, this is a snapshot. Of course, uh, we only have um, a, a short time to discuss this really large subject. But I want to just put these questions to you to reflect on what we've just been talking about. Um, what are the causes of pelvic imbalance? So there are causes and we can find that out when we um, first book a woman into the system and we have a chat with them about their health and so on. We could be finding that out. And I'll talk about that in a wee minute. Um, but the things that you, I would like you to reflect on later is how does the pelvic imbalance influence the baby's position? How does it impact the baby's journey through the pelvis? And which midwifery and obstetric practices negatively affect pelvic dimensions? Well, I just mentioned one that is really frequently used, isn't it? Open your legs, make more space. It's doing the opposite because we don't understand how the pelvis moves. And how can we optimise the biomechanical aspect of the birthing process? Well, there we have one of the main culprits. <laughs> Sedentary lifestyle. And what are we doing in the pandemic? We're all sitting, aren't we? We're all sitting a lot more. We're all just, you know... Uh, sinking in to those soft sofas and it's not doing us any good it's not doing our pelvises any good and if you are pregnant then that's going to have an impact and here are the other 
impacts that uh, imbalance or the other reasons for imbalance. We have sacroiliac dysfunction. Now, the sacroiliac joint is the joint between the sacrum and the ilium, the big hip bones. And this is a known thing. I mean, any talk to any physio osteopath or um, <coughs> chiropractor, they or, or look it up. It, sacroiliac dysfunction exists, and it's quite a common um, event in our lives because of wear and tear and going through lives not particularly with good posture and so on. And that's going to have an effect on the quality of the joint. Um, tight ligaments, tight muscles, a twisted pelvis, overtoned muscles, those fitness instructors, dancers who are doing it professional all the time are overtoned and ultra fit. And you think, oh, well, they're going to do well because they're so fit. But actually, they do sometimes run into problems. Now, I'm not suggesting that everybody who, who, who has had a fall or every horse rider will have issues. I'm not suggesting that at all, but I am saying that they have a higher chance of running into difficulties, biomechanical difficulties when the baby's coming through because of their, um, their profession or their uh, lifestyle. Accidents and injuries, you see, falling on your bum, but not just falling on your bum. What about actually breaking your ankle? You remember your ankle, your Achilles tendon is attached to your calf muscle, which runs up and is attached to the ligament that then at the knee that attached to the hamstrings and that runs and covered in connective tissue, fascia, that then thickens at the end to become another ligament, which is the tuberous ligament at the top, which goes on to connect to the sacrum. And that all has an impact. So if somebody's broken their ankle, they may be at, have a higher chance of having um, a biomechanical issue in their birth. And we want to know about that, don't we? We want to know about that so we can then um, advise them. And this is what we can do in antenatal care. In our pregnancy care, we can advise them. We can say, not a great idea to cross your legs. Remember, they have that relaxing, everything's mobile and moving a little bit more. But if they can habitually take up postures that affect the balance of their pelvis, then they're more likely to run into problems. Crossing your legs is one of them, sitting too long. So getting up and moving around and, of course, using a ball to sit on instead of that soft sofa or to drape yourself over so your pelvis can be free. Standing. Um, with one um, weight or imbalanced on one hip, like maybe with your toddler on one hip while you're pregnant, is going to have an impact. And so we can, uh, say, you know, advise them how to carry their babies better, like on the back or on their front, or just, you know, learn different ways of doing this. That they won't um, put them in jeopardy of becoming imbalanced. Wearing high heels shortens the calf legs, uh, the calf muscles. <laughs> as does sitting <clears throat> and and these are things that we need to know about and understand and once we do understand it all falls into place really easily wearing the right size bra we don't want any constrictions right up in the respiratory diaphragm we will cause congestion it will be reflected into the pelvis so who wears a bra in a way in a pandemic but if you are going to wear one and you're pregnant, wear the right size bra. It is important. Swimming is important. But again, we are restricted, aren't we? Yoga, but the right kind of yoga. Yoga that is not strengthening and, um, you know, we want pregnancy yoga that is releasing. And that's really quite important that we get the right kind. But walking, everybody can walk. I know we're in quite a tight lockdown at the minute, but there are, um, you know, you can get out there, walk in flat shoes um, and, and, and quite briskly. And walking is amazing. Everybody can afford it because it doesn't cost anything. And it is amazing. And it's very good for all of us. And of course, it lifts the spirits as well. Dancing, dance in the kitchen, put the funky music on, move your hips and really move and get to know the pelvis. We are so disconnected with our bodies because we're in front of screens, aren't we? A lot, we're on our phones and we don't pay attention. And the women and the birthing people are not connecting very well as so many of us um, with our bodies, paying attention 
and feeling what is the pelvis doing can help you move more instinctively in birth so when your baby is passing through your pelvis because you know how that feels. A calf stretch is a very simple thing to do and again that's very good especially if you are a bit sedentary and keeping that um, at a, an optimal length. And of course, seeing a therapist um, if you have a history of injury. And I know that's tough as well, um, but that is uh, the optimal care that you can give is to suggest, uh, advise um, a birthing person to, to, or a pregnant person to go and see an expert. And we are not experts, but we, um, we should be signpo signposting. Oh, thank you. So there's a birthing ball. Um, use it instead of um, a, a, a sofa. <laughs> Knees slightly lower than the hips. Um, the right size for the right person. Feet, feet flat on the floor. Move it. It moves the sacrum. It decreases back pain. Vigorous circles in labour can aid fetal descent. And that's a really good thing if the baby is a bit high. I'm just going to nearly end now, but I want this is very, very important because I'm going to just reiterate freedom to move is so important. The bed takes precedent. The bed is dominating the birthing room and this is not good. Because just talking about the physiology, talking about how our pelvises move. And here we are, 83% of us are giving birth on the bed. That's a CQC. 24% are giving birth to unassisted birth in lithotomy. Now, this is a problem. We need to be talking about this. Why are women and birthing people on the bed? I know they climb onto the bed, media is telling them that's where people give birth, but we need to uh, disavow them of that image. We need to understand it better ourselves and get out of that habit of using the bed willy-nilly. Look at this birthing uh, room here. It's an active room. Um, and I'm done. The, I do teach the uh, birthing parents, the pregnant parents, about this because they need to know how their bodies work, how birth works, how their baby passes through their pelvis, what to look out for, when things, um, what are the signs of a suboptimal position or biomechanical issue in the pelvis. And actually midwives are not great at that either, but I learned a lot from the women through many, many years of attending births, attending complex births. And of course, everybody used to say, oh, Molly, that's one for you. That was great. It was hard work, but I was very grateful for that opportunity to do um, a lot of observing and learning about what, uh, what are the signs without doing any VEs. Um, you can tell because, uh, and we all know those signs, but we have no time to talk about that because we are moving on. Um, and I'm just going to stop sharing now. There we are. <gasps> Quick flash snapshot. <laughs> Molly, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you for raising the issue of um, women on the CQC report, because the, the, even the most recent one, I yep. was talking about women who'd reported they'd given birth in lithotomy. And every time I read anything like that, mm. my teeth go on edge. Mm. It's just one, it's very undignified if you don't need to be in that position. Absolutely. And and twice it doesn't work. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it compresses the sacrum and then you're abducting those legs. So you're it's anti-gravity. Um, making less space and oh, the, the women and birthing people will push that baby out but at what cost yeah at what cost yeah. you know that's the thing are we causing more damage yeah. um, will re be revealed later with uh, pelvic floor trauma yeah. yeah I think and I think that's really really helpful and I love that last image of a proper birthing room with the bed firmly to the side that's fantastic absolutely we I can have, do we, that mm. we have one question so far that we because we've only got really one time one minute for that mm. and that's from well lauren says thank you so much molly that was brilliant yes i agree with that absolutely and Mari, maria o'malley says antenatally is there a swimming stroke that is harmful um 
Good question. It's a very good question. I mean, I can't say I'm an absolute expert, but I do believe that breaststroke with your head up is probably not a great one to do. Um, so you should be more aligned. The so backstroke and a proper crawl or a proper um, breaststroke where your head is down. So you're not, you know. Uh, so, yes, there are um, there is there are probably strokes that are better than others. Um, I'm not an expert in that, but I'm just thinking off the top of my head and what other conversations I've had is I do believe unless you're doing it properly, the breaststroke is not going to be that helpful. Fabulous. Thank you so much. And, and I'm very pleased. I know I could, I could listen well, both to Claire and to you for a lot longer and we're very uh, limited to time, but I'm very happy to tell the audience that Molly is coming to the, all Ireland um, festival also and is going to sort of continue her little mm. sort of uh, foray into the yes past. and I, th I have to say I know as a teacher and I mean I'm always very keen on physiology and anatomy because it, I think if you understand why, how it works mm. help women but mm. I also know that a lot of um, this sort of material is being left to students to learn on their own. It's quite, exactly. it's quite difficult if you're on your own. And it is difficult. Um, and, and, and really, why on earth should it not be part of our training? It should be. It's a really essential element. And, well, it's too much to talk about right now, but I do talk about that in my courses because it is actually a feminist issue um it's political we um <laughs> i'm going to say something maybe a wee bit controversial but or not um, i mean we didn't know the size of the clitoris until 1996 you know that says a lot about women's uh, bodies and what we know about women's bodies and our expertise is childbirth and we need to know about the pelvis and it's quite startling and i would i'd say it's a travesty that we don't have this information in our training well i think there's going to be a bit of a twitter storm after that molly <laughs> i love the um human architecture and the, the great <laughs> respect and love you have for that pelvis it's fantastic i've really enjoyed your session thank, thank you. you so much for coming thank you we have to gallop on